I have a special guest today. Let me share how I kind of connected with her. Miguel Lebron, who's my producer and does everything else that has to do with this podcast outside of content, tagged me in a Facebook Live that she did nine weeks ago. And it was amazing because I felt the sincerity, the truth, the honesty, and the Holy Spirit while listening to her share her testimony. And she did it in Spanish. So the Lord has to be just sitting on my shoulder for me to listen to something in Spanish, but it just really captivated me. And I felt like God had partnered with her and her process and her story. And I know so many people who really, really, really need to hear her experience. And her name is Arelis Yvonne. Arelis. Arelis. I knew I wasn't going to get it. <laughs> Arelis Yvonne. And so I'm going to give her the opportunity to share her story transparently and then go from there. You are now listening to the voice of Tamar with Vanessa Santiago. My name is Aralis Yvonne, and I'm a domestic violence survivor. And I'm not gonna lie, I we used to pretend that it was pretty because that's what we let the world see because whatever happened inside the house which was domestic violence because I was not aware of what was going on with my kids I kept it to myself I did try to speak to certain people but that's like a taboo in the Christian area it's like no don't talk about that pray to God it's gonna be fixed um, even though you go to church covering your bru bruises, it's like, it's, a, it's acceptable. Just be quiet. Don't say nothing. And I was going through that. But for years later, to find out that there was more into what was really happening in my household um, made it more of a nightmare. I married him very young. I was 24. And he was 37. I met him in church and I was very attracted to him because I was a single mom of two girls. Um, he had his life put together. He had a good job. He was preaching the word of God. <laughs> he knew how to speak. He, his parents are pastors. He came from a good family. Um, it was very like a whole package that this is what I've been praying for. But I'm going to be honest. <laughs> when I met my ex-husband, I prayed. But at the same time, there's the fact of you praying and asking God for confirmation. Is this yours? Mm -hmm. It's like, I already decided I want this. This is what I want. Mm -hmm. I like what I see. And this is what I want. And I remember feeling that it was not meant to be. It was not from God. And my stepdad telling me, are you sure you're going to marry him? And he's like, are you sure? And I'm like, yes, I'm going to marry him. We were going to get married on March 31st. And on March 27, my niece passes away. That was like... <laughs> you're really letting me know I'm not supposed to get married. I tell this guy, let's cancel the wedding. He was not in for it. Mm -hmm. We still got married and it didn't feel, it didn't feel good from the very beginning. Instead of marrying into a peaceful atmosphere, I married into a darkness atmosphere and I felt like something was off, but I was so enchanted, honeymoon stage and everything. And then when I started realizing that this does not feel right, um, I got pregnant. As soon as I, I gave birth to my son, because I noticed how he was with my, with my girls. In the beginning, he was very good with my girls. But then when we got married, smallest one, she was a year old. And if she would get the, her, her tantrums and scream, he would get really mad, angry. Things got a little worse with time. I, I started feeling like this man doesn't love my girls. You know, like there's something off. But then I was pregnant and, and then I'm a pastor's 
stepdaughter and his parents were pastors and I didn't want the whole, oh, she got married and look it, now she's getting divorced. So I stay quiet. And once I gave birth to my son, instantly the abuse started. And I'm talking about my son, my son was born and a month later was the first time that that man put his hand on me. And it was bad. From there on, it was a battle. It was a battle in that this is the other thing. A lot of women don't like hearing the the exes. You don't want to hear what she has to say. But let me tell you something. Sometimes these women don't have the, the intention of trying to break your relationship. There are mm -hmm. actually women out there that really don't want you to go through what they went through. Mm -hmm. And his ex-wife actually warned me. She waited for him not to be home to call me to let me know, be careful. She said, you know, he's not what you think he is. Be careful. Mm -hmm. So she warned me. And I tell a lot of females, if you hear his ex saying something, you should take that in consideration that maybe she's not trying to hate or try to break your relationship. She Maybe she's warning. That's like a warning sign. Go pray on it and don't, don't ignore the red flags. And I, I say this very, like, don't ignore. Whatever you ignore in the beginning is later on is what's going to destroy you and your relationship with this person. And I ignored a lot of the red flags. I um, I ignored the, the him getting bothered with my daughters. I ignored the, the abuse. I started closing up and I spoke to a couple of people down the, the relationship. I started speaking to, I had a good friend that I had told her, you know, she said, I, I noticed that since you got married, you're not the same. And her mom told her, call her because I feel like that man abuses her. And when she called me, I, I cried, but I went into detail, but I said, it's not what I thought it was going to be. And I stayed quiet and he pushed away because my whole entire marriage, that's what he did. He pushed people away. He kept me away from people, but a lot of things were hidden. Like people didn't notice along the way. It's just, they didn't dare to speak up or didn't dare to say anything as a parent from the healing part, you start feeling like you were the most, the worst parent in the world. So he had moved me to Massachusetts. I had my son over there, but then he moves me to Dunkirk. And when we're in Dunkirk, um, a lot of the abuse happened and my, I will go to church with bruises in my arms, but I will cover it. He was very envious about anything that if God will use me in a way, preaching, singing, giving a word to someone, he didn't like it. As a, a, a person that's been abused, there comes a time that you either get used to it or you feel that you're so in love with that person and that whatever they, they say that you can't live without me. You're not going to survive. Um, no one's going to love you like me. You're not good enough. You start feeling like, I don't have a way out. If I leave this, how am I going to really do it out there? Yeah. And I, and he did that during the whole marriage. Like he literally like put in, in me that I was not good enough, that I was not going to be able to do anything on my own, that, that, my family weren't, wasn't going to be there for me. Um, it was always putting me down. In 10 years of marriage, I can tell you that I maybe had in my hands maybe $200. And I'm talking during the 10 years. I'm talking about during the 10 years. He managed everything. He managed how how much gas I would put in my car. He would manage if I would go out to visit my family, he would start harassing me in the phone. Um, my kids and I went through a lot of moments where there was no food in the house. It was a lot of controlling. I remember not eating and drinking coffee all day to stretch whatever food I had in my house so my kids can have something to eat. 
it felt like a like like a nightmare that I wanted to get up from, but I didn't know how to get out from. I during the whole marriage, and this is something that a lot of people they you know they don't women don't like speaking about, but yes, I understand that when you get married, you guys become one. But if a woman is going through something and she can't, you know, as your wife at that precise moment, you know, be understanding. Yeah. With him, there was no understanding. I could have had a surgery and he would still get what he wanted. And um, I think the most traumatizing one was when um, I had a really bad surgery. I just had a really delicate surgery that almost cost me my life. And I was down to, I weight back then I was like 120 pounds. It was really skinny because um, I got really sick. Here's this man that lifts weight, getting what he wants. Yeah. It's still rape. Yeah. Married to me or not is still right. And I think that that's so important too, because a lot of women think that if they're in a boyfriend and girlfriend relationship or even a marriage and they don't want, they don't want to be intimate with their partner and their partner takes it that that's not considered rape. And it's like, that is rape because I don't want to. And now you are forcing me. Anything that comes with force is not voluntary, is not, is rape. So I think that's so important to say. It is. It is. Um, a lot of females don't like speaking about it, um, but it's very necessary. It's like, I understand I'm married to you, but I'm healing. I'm, I'm going through some, you know, my body's going through something really difficult. And that that just made um, things worse. Ended up, you know, back in the hospital. And this was constantly like in and out of the hospital. I was in and out of the hospital for almost four years. They couldn't, and I know the hospitals, they, 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 they kind of, because they would ask, Yeah. they would ask and they would even send um, social workers. Are you okay? And I kept saying, yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Everything's perfect. And during these four years of me being in the hospital, because I used to suffer from epilepsy disorder. Um, since I was nine months old, but during my marriage with this man, my epilepsy disorder got really out of control because the stress causes it. It makes it worse. Mm. And I was constantly, and when I would have an epilepsy, like a, a seizure, um, I couldn't breathe. Mm. And a lot of occasion I would have a seizure and he would kick the kids out of the room and close the door mm. and let me in the room having a seizure. And my daughter, knowing my mom can't breathe, like she can't breathe. And he's like, don't dare going into the room, leave her there. Yeah. And one time she disobeyed him because she said that she heard me gasping for air and she went into the room. And when she went into the room, I don't know if it was that it, my face was turning another color or what, but whatever happened at that precise moment, I ended up in the hospital, not in good condition. But if it wasn't because she disobeyed, I would not, I would not be here. We did a lot of prayer and a lot of crying and a lot, like, what did I do? I married the wrong person. I did a lot of that. I married the wrong person because I didn't wait. <laughs> I didn't wait. And sometimes we want to rush ahead of what, what God has for us. And it's like, waiting is not going to kill you. But falling in the wrong hands might kill you. And I started noticing certain things that bother me. And I would tell him, and this was 2000, before that, it was like, no matter how much he did to me, I saw this man, like, I love him, I love him, I love him. But then in 2015, something happened, something, I don't know. I, I say it was God starting to remove, you know, so many it was like a wake up call for me. And he went to Massachusetts to prepare everything for us to move. And my feelings for him started to change drastically. Mm 
And while he's preparing over there, I'm noticing um, I feel better without him here. It feels so peaceful without him in my house. Me and the kids are so happy without him here. And I started feeling the urge of wanting to stay, but then we moved to Massachusetts and he moved us to, to a town where I didn't know anybody. The worst part was me and my kids went through, through months, and I'm talking a month, without having no human contact. And he would do that isolation. That's one of the things they do. They isolate you. He didn't want me to talk to my mom. He didn't want me to talk to my family. He didn't want me to say nothing. But then, like I said, before I moved there, I, I was starting to see things differently. I, didn't, I was not enchanted with this man anymore. I wanted out. So when I went to Fishburg, I would walk for even 10 miles because I couldn't handle the isolation. I couldn't handle hearing my kids complaining about, we don't have a life. We don't see people. We're always alone. It's only us. And he goes to work all the way to Boston. And we're here with no human contact. And they would complain. They would cry. And I'm not going to lie to you. I would sit down with them and cry too. And my daughter and I, we would sit down in the kitchen table and I would tell her, what if we get in the car and drive until there's no more gas? My daughter's eyes would light up at that moment, but I didn't know what was going on. All I know was that her eyes would light up as in, oh my God, I see a light. My mom's speaking about leaving this man. Like, But then um, I remember then I was starting to speak with my sister. I started asking my sister questions. She found it a little bit weird, like what's going on. But I didn't went into a lot of details because I'm I, I do believe that whatever happens in your house stays in the house, but there's certain things that shouldn't stay only in your house. If you're going through abuse, you shouldn't stay quiet. If you're being raped, you shouldn't stay quiet. If you're anything like that, yeah. not abuse. Abuse is not something that you, you should keep private. It's not something that you should keep quiet. So I remember starting to talk to my sister because I couldn't anymore. Then I started telling her, my kids and I would be with broken shoes, broken clothes. He would not buy us clothes. He would not buy us shoes. And I started complaining and telling my sister, I don't have shoes. I'm using some flip-flops right now because my only shoes I had broke and he doesn't want to give me money to go buy any shoes. Not even my own money that was in the bank. And my sister said, you know what? I'm going to send you money. So things happen, you know, and we ended up moving to Worcester. Finally to a city that, you know, to a part of Massachusetts is more, not country, more, you know, more people. I got angry because I tried speaking out to a person in church, a lady, because they, they, she said, let me babysit your, your kids so you can go on a date with your husband. And I told her these words. I'm like, I don't want to be alone with my husband. Hmm. If I see a woman, and let me tell you, I've had women that have been abused, and they don't have to say much for me to realize that they're in an abusive relationship. If I see a woman that's telling me that she don't want to be alone with her husband, something's going on. Yeah. She's like, no, try, try to go. What, what do you mean? No, you know, let's hide it again. I'm like, I don't want to be alone with him. I told her, you know, there's things you don't know. She tried changing the subject. Hmm. And I felt like I hit a wall. It's like, I don't have no one to tell that, that I'm being abused. I can't tell no one that I'm being abused by this man. And I can't say nothing. And, and we're all miserable in this house. And then when we moved to, to Worcester, I finally convinced them if I can get a job. Mm-hmm. And he finally let me get a job. That was like freedom to me. But you think because I was working, I could, no, I didn't see my paycheck. Mm. I didn't get to see my paycheck. I worked and it, you, I'm gonna be honest, even though I never touched the money that I, that I made, the fact that I was able to get out of the house was a, I would take the kids to school, drop them off and go to work. And that for me was enough freedom for me, like at that moment. And um, at the end of the marriage, he was drinking. 
he would drink to the point where the next day he would not remember anything that he said or did. And a lot of the stuff that he said and did was the most scariest thing. He would yell at the kids. He got more aggressive. And a lot of the times I had to get in the, in the way so he would not get aggressive with the kids. It was horrible. And then I, not only that, he would sleep with a knife underneath his bed. And the only thing he told me that he was going to, he was going to get rid of me eventually. <laughs> Imagine you being tired because you're tired because you work and, and stuff, but you can't sleep because you're thinking, what if he kills me today? I was not the only one. My girls started feeling the same way that what, what if mom doesn't wake up? What if he kills her? Things got him more, more abuse. And, um, I started noticing that not only with me, now he wants to get aggressive with the kids too. Before it was all yelling and intimidating with his face. But at the end, it was more like, I want to hit you and me having to get in the middle. But I remember that, I remember like, I was already like in a dark place. I've never been a drinker, never. But I was so tired. I poured myself a drink. And I was sitting down on the table and I still remember, <laughs> and I've testified about this in church, hearing God's voice calling me. And I went and looked, I went into the room and I asked my ex-husband, did you call me? And I asked my, my girls and they're all sleeping. <laughs> and I go sit down again and I hear my name called. And all I was able to do was like cry, cry. And I, and that was a month before, like a month before. And, and I still remember that, that, that moment, that spiritual moment that I had with God, like, I'm going to get you out. And I felt that like, he's going to get me out. Like a week later, I was celebrating my last anniversary, March 31st. And he's, he's, he was never a man of bringing flowers or anything, but at the end, I think he was, he was noticing that the love was in there. I was not there anymore. I didn't, I didn't want, I wanted out. I remember that it was just, he brought some flowers and which was shocking to me. And it was our 10 year anniversary. He brought the flowers and I smelled the flowers and, and I heard this is your last anniversary. I stared at him and I said, this is our last anniversary. He's like, why are you planning to leave me? I'm like, I don't know. But I heard, it was like, I started from that moment on, God is going to get me out. I started praying in my car on my way to work. I started praying in the bathroom because he would mock me if he would see me praying. Now you you think you're a Christian. Oh, now you think you're holy. And he would start mocking me like that. So I started praying, you know, in the car and I started praying in, in the bathroom. And, and I'm like, God, take me out, do something, make a way. And I started noticing things was very weird, like weird as in this, it was intense. Like, like I started feeling like you can feel when something's about to happen, but you just don't, you can't put your finger on it. But the thing is that my daughter had, had told my sister what was going on. My sister started praying and she's like, I need you to guide me, God. I need you to guide me because if I make a wrong mistake, he's going to notice and something bad is going to happen. So she had to think quickly, how can I get my sister out of the situation? And my niece and my nephew, we were, we were going to go to Buffalo. And he said, no, take the girls to Buffalo and I'll stay with, with our son. He put my son in a, in a baseball he was the coach for the, for the team that did not sit well with me. You're not going, you're not going to stay. If you're staying, I'm not going, I'm not going to drive all the way to Buffalo by myself. Yeah. When I told my sister, this, my sister tells me, what if he's already feeling and his, he's planning to take. Yeah. So she got scared. She started moving things quicker and she told my dad, but she told my dad, don't say anything. And it's like, you don't know. Something would end up happening to her that last day, like that last time that he was aggressive, he took it to another level. Yeah. He, he was drunk. 
my son and my girls walked in to seeing my feet dangling because he was choking me. And I thought I was going to die, honestly, because I couldn't breathe. And I'm like, this is it. I'm trying to put my fingers in his eyes and I'm trying to get off from this man. He's going to kill me. I'm going to die in his hands. Yeah. You know, that was within days before my, my sister actually arrived to, to Massachusetts. And um, I'm like, here, I'm going to end up dying in the hands of a man that was supposed to love and protect me and my kids and he, he's going to end up killing me. But the, the day before everything blew up, I started noticing my girls were really acting weird. I didn't know why. The night before me and him had a really, really bad argument. And when I went to bed, I told him that I was tired of the life we had, that I that that I was tired of my life, that I was that I couldn't take it anymore, that I I couldn't handle this anymore. And he said, "Go hang yourself." Oh, that's great. That's what he said. And the enemy played with my head so bad because at that precise moment, I started feeling like, you know what? I should. The only thing that was holding me was that I started praying and that I was starting to without realizing I was starting to build up my relationship with God. So that's what holds me back from doing anything like that. But I was starting to feel suicidal. Like I don't have a way out. Yeah. But I remember that at that precise moment, I started feeling like I'm crying and crying and said, God, this is not the life I want. This is not what I want. And feeling the peace, I'm, I'm going to handle this. Like I felt, I felt, for, from crying and from feeling like I wanted to commit suicide, I started feeling peace and I ended up falling asleep. The next day, they called me from work and they tell me, oh, you don't have, none of your clients are, they, they, you know, they don't need you today. So you have the day off. And I'm like, okay. So my ex-husband act like nothing happened. We kiss in the morning. I made him his breakfast because and I act like nothing happened because that was what I did during 10 years. And I'm sitting down in my house and I receive a call from my sister. And she said, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm sitting down in the, in, in the house. She, she's like, you're not working? I'm like, no. And she's like, good. She's like, don't ask questions. Just get in your car and come and get me in Springfield. And don't tell your husband. She said, don't tell your husband. And that hit me like, wait a minute. My sister's never told me not to tell this man nothing. So I'm like, if she's telling me to get in my car and go pick her up, not tell my, my then husband, I'm going to obey. But there was another thing. I needed to put gas in my car. And he had tagged the bank card that whatever I did with the bank card would notify him that I used the card. So I, I remember I'm like, he's going to know. He's going to get that text that I put gas and he's going to question. But I'm like, whatever, I'm going to go. And I put the gas, I, I, I actually filled up the tank and, and I'm like, I'm going to ignore the phone because he's going to blow up the phone. And I was scared. I'm not going to lie to you. I was scared out of my mind. I was like, oh, my God. And I drove all the way to, to Springfield without knowing that God was actually making a way for me. I was driving straight to my way. And I didn't even know that. I was like, I was just thinking I'm going to go drive to pick up my sister. And that's it. I did not think at any point in time. And I say this and it, it's like, it's like reliving the moment. At any point in time, I was not thinking that God was actually, that word he said, I'm going to make a way. He was making a way where I really didn't think there was a way. And I'm driving to it, not even knowing that I'm driving to, hello, he's opening the seat. <laughs> it's like making you a way at least. <laughs> I didn't know. All I know is I'm going to go pick up my sister. And when I'm sitting down in front of the Peter Pan station, 
and I'm waiting for her to come out. I see my sister and I'm all excited because I haven't seen my sister in a long time when she gets in the car. I can sense something's bad, but I just don't know why. I'm like, is she going to tell me that my grandfather, my grandfather died? Did she come to Massachusetts to tell me that grandpa died? Or I'm like, no, but she told me not to tell my husband. So when she sits down in a car, she comes with a mission. She's like, I have something to tell you. And I'm like, okay. And she said, your husband has been molesting your daughter since you guys got married. That precise moment when she told me what he had done to my daughter. It's like my whole world dropped. My whole world collapsed. I remember that she said, but that doesn't stop there. Your daughter spoke and called me to tell me to let me know what was going on because he started doing the same thing to my other daughter that was 11 years old. And, and he didn't start instantly touching her. He will call her into the room and, and tell her, look at this in the computer. And when she would look, it was pornography. A lot of um, almost, you know, a lot of almost happened with my my 11-year-old daughter. He almost. But whatever he did do, my oldest saw and recognized instantly. When my sister told me that that was happening, we had to do things really quick. He was at work. So I'm like, I have to drive back one hour and a half back to Worcester. She said, your daughter's already waiting for us in the school. <laughs> she had all this plan. And she's like, let's go. So I went instantly to my daughter's school, to her high school. We went over there. She came down and she thought I was going to reject. And a lot of parents do reject their kids. And a lot of parents do give their kids the back. But in my case, my mom always said, you never choose no one before your kids. Your kids come before anyone. We went in there and in the school, they had a sheriff <laughs> that day. It was actually a sheriff that was there, not a regular cop, because normally it was a regular cop. So I tell them I have a situation and their face turned pale white. And they're like, wait a minute, like we got to handle this really quick because now we have a situation. We have to help this family. So the sheriff came out. He took our statement. He said, I'm going to drive you and your daughter to the police station from there to the courthouse to get a restraining order. When we finished in the courthouse, we went back to the house. And he was blowing up my phone. My sister's like, he's been calling your phone. He hasn't stopped calling your phone. I'm like, oh, my God, it's, it's heading to the time that he's getting out of work. And I started getting scared because I'm like, we're going to bump into him when we get home. So I'm driving. It was like I seen Satan in front of me. <laughs> and I, I drove really quick. And we, we drove to the front. And at that precise moment, my dad arrives. And he stands in the front. And I'm like, he's right behind us. And the social worker from Child Protection arrives at the same time. So we all go upstairs until the cops come. Because the CPS worker reports that he's around the area. And when we go to the third floor where I live, we lock the door. He went through the back door because he was trying to knock the door down. And my dad went to the back door and called him by his name and said, stop. He didn't want to stop. And I remember that the cops came. And when he came upstairs, they arrested him downstairs. I still remember looking down the window and seeing this man being handcuffed. It was like when someone's mask has been removed, it was not the man that I had married. I looked down and he had this, like, if I can rip your head off type of look. And he looked at us, but he stared at my sister, like, how dare you? And it was a whole process because my daughter was about to graduate. They told me, you know, you can't stay with this man. Obviously, I'm not going to stay with him. They didn't believe me. And I'm like, no, because I'm planning to go back to Buffalo with my family. But my daughter is about to graduate. So we had to do it. My mom had to come back all the, all the way to Worcester 
to be with me because I was literally by myself with my kids, surrounded by his family. So my mom did not trust that. She's like, no, I'm going to go with you until your daughter graduates. And, and my mom and I still talk about that. My kids and I went through a lot of um, no food in the house. He would deprive us from that. And when he, when he left, blessings started to pour. It's like that whatever was holding down the blessings that was removed from my house, that minute he was removed from my house, blessings started to pour. I'm like, my kids, my mom cried. She had to go to the room when my kids were happy to see food, like a lot of food and was not, you can't have that. You can't do that. My mom's like, I can't believe you can tell the abuse and in and, and the whole situation, but even though I had a restraining order against him, his family got him out of jail. And he was caught, he actually started having the guts to call. So when my dad saw that he actually had the guts to call, even though there's a restraining order for you not to do that, my dad, a couple of minutes later, he calls me, start packing. I'm like, what? Start packing. You're not leaving the end of the month, you're leaving the, at the end of the week. I got to get you out of Massachusetts as soon as possible. And he's like, call your stepdad, tell him to come because I'm going to need his help. And between my stepdad, two older men, did a whole move from a third floor between them, my daughter, my mom. We packed things within a week. Within a week, we got rid of stuff. We kept it quiet from his family for them not to find out that we were going to leave. We ended up moving back right after my daughter graduated. So the move happened quickly. And the thing is, was even, even the, the financial part got supply the money for, for, the, for us to do the move. And in that whole process, within him leaving, us moving back to Buffalo, even God even supply um, pastors for that those few weeks that I was there, I had some pastors, which I love dearly. You know, I love them so much from Massachusetts. They reached out to me and it was just, God had revealed to the pastor that there was something happening to call. And when he called, when he told his wife to call, I was in the room, in my bedroom crying with my kids, not knowing what to do. And that was, that was the first key. It's like I say, he was the pastor that God used to put the bandages and come over here. It's time to heal. It's going to start, you know, now it's the process. And yeah, that was the pastor that did that. So God put everything, everything, like everything in, in his way, like, and like for, for us to be able to get out of that, that life we had and, and to come back to Buffalo. Was I happy to come back to Buffalo? No, I was not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like Buffalo, but hey, yeah. um, it's better than the life I had. Yeah. And so what would you say to like a mother who has had children that have experienced different violations and they're just living under the guilt and condemnation of like not seeing that? Like, what would your response be to them? When these things happen and your kids are being violated by these people. You got to understand that they, they have experience with this before. So they know what they're doing and they know how to be sneaky. There was no way that you were going to be able to notice because they're going to wait for the right moment to do it. So you won't realize that's the, that's the thing. One of the things that I, I would think is like, how couldn't I have noticed? Like I was staring at my kids and I'm like, how, how is it possible that I didn't notice this happened under my roof and I didn't notice? It's like, he would wake up in the middle of the night and go to my daughter's room. And how didn't I notice this? What kind of a mother am I just to keep sleeping? And I even know that he was in my daughter's room. These are things that is out of our hands because we didn't know. It's like, we did not know. You did not know that you this situation was happening. You know, when you're a parent that you protect your kids, you know you did your best. You know you did everything possible to, to protect your kid. I don't know, there's parents that don't do it. 
that that they decide to to choose the predators um side but there's mothers like they would do anything for their kids when you didn't know you didn't know but you did something as soon as you found out and for those parents that did do something you did do something if you did do something because not every parent do that if you did do something when you found out you just right there you're you're showing the love and the in the care and how much your kids matter to you that you 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 didn't leave it there you didn't swipe it under the rug like like they used to do back in the days yeah you did something and i did i pre i pressed charges it's like for those parents that did do something feel proud of the fact that you didn't just pretend like let's hide it yeah no yeah. you did something what is your advice to that mom who has a strained relationship with their child because of something like this? <sighs> I'm going through that right now. Yeah. And in all this, I'm going to tell you, this is the last thing that, that I was advised <laughs> that I can't, I keep like, you know, when God keeps using people to tell you the same thing, and it's so simple. Be quiet and pray and trust in me. They're not all going to heal the same way. All three of my kids, because at the end of um, almost two years later, my son spoke up. He actually spoke up. The only thing that that gave him the, the courage to speak, speaking to them, you know, there shouldn't be, I don't care who it is, family, family, friends, whoever. No one should invade your body. Mm -hmm. I don't care who it is. And my son was in his room thinking and thinking and thinking. And when he finally spoke and told me what had happened to him, first he he didn't he didn't want to you know lose his dad. Then then he went through when he found out what his dad had done to his sisters. And when you know he figured out because kids there's kids that don't know that that's not normal. Yeah. And my son didn't think it was wrong what his dad had done to him. But then when he realized, wow, I was invaded. So they all healed differently. After all that you have been through, not only your own trauma, but now the trauma of three of your children, how can you testify about this without feeling like it's the end of the world? God. <laughs> That's my answer too. Every time. <laughs> God. <laughs> if it wasn't because of Jesus. <laughs> telling you. Like I came from Massachusetts back and I was a hot mess. I remember the words he gave me. He used the pastor in Massachusetts to give me words. I'm going to use you. And you're going to be speaking in front of a multitude of women. Like you're going to be in a platform. There's going to be a bunch of women and you're going to speak to them about what you survived. But yet I haven't gotten to that point yet. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Here I'm a hot mess. God is removing me from Egypt. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I, I use this. Like, oh, he's removing me from Egypt. So I'm out of Egypt, I'm in the desert, and I have all the bad habits from Egypt. And I was in a mold that wasn't meant for me. I was supposed to be in a mold that God precisely made for me, but yet here came this man and put me in a mold that I did not fit in. And, and in that process in the desert, let me tell you, it hurt. And I say this, and now I don't cry when I say this, but man, did it hurt. It used to hurt to breathe my heart hurt in such a way that i cannot even describe i would spend three four five hours with my head my forehead in the floor praying and crying i would get up and my eyes would be looking like i would look like a pumpkin like literally my face all like swollen to go shower so it could not come down to sit down in my room and start crying again I couldn't live with the guilt. I couldn't. It's like, it killed me. And all I would say in all that, wrap me in your arms. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I didn't have words. Just please hide me. Like, just 
wrap me. Don't, don't let me go. And don't please hold me, God, because I can't take this pain. And it was so bad. Like my hair started falling. I lost a lot of weight. And I'm talking about I lost weight. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't even go back to work. Mm-hmm. I got I got in such a depression. My mom and my sister had to help me take care of my kids. That's the part people don't see. I, I fell in such a bad depression that I didn't even want to go. I didn't want to get out of the house. I wanted to hide the persecution that my kids and I went through. It was horrible. The attacks from people that we knew people choosing to, to believe him and everything we went, we went through humiliations. I will go to the church events. Okay. And people will literally pass through me like pastor's wives. They will go by me and not, and I would say, God bless you. And they would just literally pass by me. Yeah. And I think that, I think that that's so important, right? So again, my, my platform is not a Christian podcast. And I do the air quotes because I, I love Jesus. That's where I stand. I love Jesus and I'm a follower of him, but I've always been really honest on my platform to just share that the church is flawed now. And then I think that's why it's important to know the heart of God and to be in relationship with God so that when you see people who don't mirror his heart, you don't pin that against God. And so there are moments where church people will take sides and believe the wrong person, the person who's doing wrong because they are looking nice. You know, earlier you said that he was handsome. He was well-spoken. He was used by God. And therefore, you know, he was just known as this awesome person because in our minds, rapists are old white men with white vans and little puppies who are luring girls in on an alleyway when that's not the case. So although I've shared multiple times that I've experienced violation in the church and now she's sharing that she's she was ridiculed in the church and that she was hurt by someone who claimed to know the heart of God, it's not that only in church these things are happening. This happens everywhere. I just love Jesus. I love people who love Jesus and and most of the times People who come on my platform know him well and have experienced hurt at church, just like people experience hurt in the world or hurt at their jobs or hurt through their parents. And so I think that that's so important for us to to really point out because a lot of the people will not try to get to know who Jesus is again because of their personal experience in the church. If nothing else, I just want people to know that the heart and nature of God is not always what is exemplified at church. Mm -hmm. You will not find perfection there. If I would have looked, and let me tell you, my sister snapped me out of it a lot of times because there was times that I wanted to stop. I wanted to stop going to church. I wanted to stop just, I wanted to hide. And my sister's like, it was not God who hurt you. Yeah. It's people that they're ignorant Mm -hmm. and they want to choose but God will always bring, she's like, this is all going to change when everything comes out to the light. She's like, for now, you're not going to leave God just because of what others do. Because at the end of the day, if it wouldn't have been because of God, I would not be standing. People ask me, how, how did you survive that? (laughs) When you are in that moment, in that dark place, and you are crying out to God, I guarantee you, that you're not going to stand up from that prayer the same way. You're not going to feel the same way. You're not going to feel, you're going to feel like strength was given to you at that precise moment. And that's what helped me, even if it was crawling, to keep going and and pushing forward. You've been through things in life, so you do me a favor (laughs) and you're going to put your skirt in your place, okay? And you're going to be strong, okay? Because you've been through worse. Yeah, she's yeah. like, you've been through worse. You're not gonna let people scare you off. Yeah. She's like, God will handle that, but you're gonna go to church. And I'm like, but what do I do when I get human? She's like, you're gonna go into church, you're not gonna look at men, you're yeah. going to go praise God. And I'm gonna tell you something a lot of people are like, How the heck did you do that? I'm like, My God is strong, yeah, and yeah. He gave me the strength to do that, to overcome that, not to to, to hide myself away. Yeah. Not to hide away. And, and if it wasn't because of him, I would not be standing here at all. 
and looking <laughs> as good as you do because a lot of people won't see this but I mean if your glory is your hair it is there okay so you don't look like what you've been through and I I, I feel like I, there's just so much I can take from this and I feel like I'm leaving this situation with more wisdom and knowing how to help people who've experienced it so I am so grateful I'm grateful that you did that live twice because it was deleted the first time (laughs) and you did it again. And I was tagged and we were able to make this connection. And so I just want you to give people one piece of advice that will help them if they've experienced this. And then we're going to pray. Hold on to God. Like seriously, like in the, in the midst of everything, lean on to him. Honestly, like it's going to be tough. And there's going to be moments that you're going to want to give up. And there's going to be moments that you're going to feel like you can't handle it anymore. But when we are weak, our God is strong. At the end of the day, the only one that will never betray you, the only one that will always be there at all times, willing to to heal every, every single scar everyone else did and created, and to help you move forward is God. I survived because of God. I survived, my kids survived because of God. But the key is do everything that you're supposed to. Take your kids constantly, go, you take constantly if necessary, do everything that you need to do to get, you know, that professional help. But the main key here is God. Yeah, I mean, it's God for me too. So I'm not (laughs) mad at it at all. All right, so we're going to pray now. Father, we give you thanks for for this moment that you have given us. This moment that I didn't expect, but I know you have been glorifying yourself in a way that we don't even understand yet. I know that everything that we have spoken at this precise moment, at this night, God, this is going to get to someone that needs to hear this words of hope. The, the words that they, they need at that precise moment. I ask you, God, that when they, the, when people start listening to this testimony, that you may glorify yourself, that people may, their eyes may be open, that they may, may have hope, they may see the light at the end of the tunnel, and they may understand that you will make a way where there's no way, God. I ask you, God, that those that don't have, they, they, they feel like they don't have a way out, that at this precise moment when they do see this, they see or they hear this testimony, God, that they 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 have the courage, they can build the courage to open their mouth and speak and 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 be free from whatever is holding them hostage. God, I give you thanks for this moment because I know that that this is not planned from us. It was planned from you, and that you are going to do something amazingly big i ask you god for you to glorify yourself in a big way so you that you may bless this ministry this podcast that she has and that she may keep speaking whatever you put in her mouth god whatever you put in her mouth and that she may keep reaching out those victims out there that they're survivors now they're no longer victims i ask you god to keep blessing her in a special way we ask that you glorify yourself in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So thank you all for tuning in, for listening. So until next week, everyone, thank you again.